the one about crucifying our Lord again. But that certainly is uh, one of the crucial understandings of what happens uh, in the book of Hebrews when those who had, had uh, once learned about Jesus and they had named him as Savior as they had come from their old ways, in this case their old ways of Judaism, as they had come from that and then they were being persecuted and, and pressured to ter- return to that because they were being persecuted by their own Jewish brethren. Uh, one of the crucial understandings about how much better Jesus really is is that if you leave Jesus and you go back to your former ways it is like crucifying him again so that's a a very powerful thought you know sometimes uh, at the beginning of uh, a a book in the Bible those who uh, put uh, publish the Bibles they'll write a little heading and I I do find this heading in my Bible uh, quite interesting I won't read all of it to you it's really a description of what Hebrews is and it's quite well done but uh, one of the statements though that uh, this person writes in describing what's at stake here in the Bible he says um, he says to them in short there is more to be gained in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. There's more to be gained in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. And so uh, we talked last week in part one of this lesson that we're calling Better Beware. We talked last week how uh, we sometimes can find things and we can become somewhat enamored with things and we, we might even think we can't even do without those things. We can live without those things if possible. They're the greatest things in the world. And then... Maybe in a few days or a few weeks or a few months or a few years, we act like they're nothing to us. We act like that they aren't important to us. And so if we can do those things, if, if, if great things can slip from our appreciation, if we can count them as matters of importance, but then later we turn them into some ordinary thing, then that can be done also with our salvation, the most important thing we have. And so we said last week, that is why the book of Hebrews was given to us. Very few, probably, if I'm guessing, no one in this audience came from Judaism and converted from it and became a Christian. Yet that was the background of those who had come to know Jesus in this book, in the book of Hebrews. And so they had the opportunity to learn about something better. And they, in grasping the better, in accepting the better, they had to leave something behind. And so that is the general application for us when we study the book of Hebrews. If we have come to Jesus, it means we had to leave something behind. And yet the tragic thing is we sometimes forget how much better Jesus really is than what we've left behind. And believe it or not, sometimes those who come to Jesus and find the most important thing, they're willing to give that up. They're willing to crucify the Lord again, if you will, and go back into the world and go back to what they had left behind. And so what Hebrews describes is a wonderful opportunity to find the very best thing, to find Jesus, to find how he is far better than anything else you can imagine. But also, there are warnings in the book of Hebrews that when you find Jesus, you should never leave him. You should never turn your back on him. And yet that is what the the original readers of this book were up against and quite frankly that's what we're up against because as you know the battle is real the battle does belong to the Lord but the battle is real he is in a fight for our souls what he wants more than anything is to influence us to cause us to leave the best thing we've ever found Jesus and he wants us to turn back to things that we had formerly left behind So last week we spent time talking about how the book of Hebrews shows us how Jesus is better. Contextually, uh, we we really gave, uh, in in explaining that, an outline of the book of Hebrews. I'll quickly remind you of that in case you weren't here last week. Uh, We said that Jesus is better than the angels. That's chapter 1 through chapter 2 and verse 18. He's better than Moses, chapter 3 through chapter 4, 13. He's better than the Old Testament high priest that's chapter 4 14 through chapter 7 verse 28 he's also better than the old covenant chapter 8 verse 1 through chapter 9 28 
And he's also better than all of the Old Testament sacrifices they were commanded to make under that covenant. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 39. And then really the rest of the book, he's better than the salvation that those who lived under that covenant um, experienced. Salvation in the sense of what they had to do. They looked for a promise that they never got to see be fulfilled. That's chapter 11, verse 1 through the end of the book. And so um, that was the message last week, that Jesus is better, that Christ is better, that Christ really, for them, he was better than anything they had to leave behind in Judaism. For us, he's better than anything we might have left behind in coming to him. And so uh, as we talk about how he is better, but also realizing the second part of the the lesson in this two-part lesson would be there are some warnings about us losing what we have found. And so if it's entirely possible to leave the best thing for something second rate or less important, then we need to pay attention if that applies to the most important thing, and that is our soul. And I would remind you that any person who at any time comes to Jesus can be tempted to leave him behind. I think you probably understand that, and you appreciate that, that is one of the reasons that you're here tonight. You probably have found that the more you can gather with God's people, the more you can sing songs and you can pray and you can study Scripture, it helps you not do that. It helps you not leave the most precious thing behind. See, the, the worst thing that could happen to any of us is for us to leave Jesus behind. Listen to these words. These are from Second Peter chapter 2. Where Peter says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's basically when a person repents and they have knowledge of Jesus and they come to him and they become a Christian. If, he says, they have done those things, but then they are, again, entangled in them or the things they left behind. If they are entangled in them, and overcome, there's a word we talked about this morning. He says, if that happens, the latter end is worse than the beginning. He says, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than knowing it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, a sow having been washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so it is possible for one to find the very best thing and then to lose it. And Peter reminds us, not only is that possible, it is the very worst thing that could happen to any of us. But, but having noted that, having noted that it is possible for people to leave Jesus behind, I want to remind you of this as well, and this is kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Nobody leaves Jesus without a few things being true. If you end up leaving Jesus behind, there will be some common things that are going to happen in your life that would be true of that leaving Jesus behind. And they are some of the things that we're warned about here in the book of Hebrews. That is what one of the reasons he wants to write to us, not only tell us that Jesus is better, but to say, let me give you a warning. Let me warn you of what might start happening if you start getting tempted and you're thinking about leaving Jesus behind. So, so this is part two of our lesson, Better Beware. And so here are the warnings. We're going to start in chapter 2 uh, in verse 1. Chapter 2 and verse 1. And the first warning is this. Beware of drifting beware of drifting notice he says verse 1 of chapter 2 therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard lest we drift away so there's the the concept of drifting give the most earnest heed to the things that we've heard lest we drift away he says for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, 
God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. There's a long question he asked there from verses 2 uh, to verse 4. But at the beginning of this, in verse 1 though, we're warned about the possibility of drifting from the most precious thing we've ever found. Now if you're drifting away from something... It's starting to happen very slowly. It's something that you might not even be paying attention to. That's why some of the translations uh, maybe use the word slip here. It's the idea that something is slipping past you or it is flowing past you. And perhaps it's happening so slowly you can't even realize it. You ever been in a boat out on open water um, and you're drifting? Well, whether you realize it or not, you're moving. You're, You're really moving but it's really hard to tell. And, and that is the idea here. This is not a sudden, painfully obvious thing, but it's actually something that can, that can sneak up on you. And so he says, you know, you need to know that if this starts happening, then what you're really doing, verse 3, is you're starting to neglect the great salvation. You're neglecting the great salvation. The, the word neglect here is, is something that means you're, you're taking it for granted or you're, you're making light of it. Or, it's, to me, or it means you, you don't even care anymore about that. It's the very same word that, that's used in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 5 when the people were invited to the great supper and it says in that verse, they made light of it. They made light of it. It says they went their own ways. One to his farm and another to his merchandise. They made light of it. They neglected it. They didn't take it seriously. Imagine that. Imagine it is possible to take your salvation so lightly that you begin to neglect the greatest thing you've ever found. That is one of the warnings in the book of Hebrews about our salvation is it is that we can neglect it to the point that it becomes less and less important to us and, and that is a very very real possibility if you neglect something or if you make light of it more than likely you're not spending very much time with it you're not caring for it like you should I'll tell you, when I first met Candy, it was before you had smartphones, and the only way you could um, communicate would be through a landline. And in, in those days, um, the only way you could, re- besides talking on the phone, the only way you could get to know someone better, and the only way you could um, get, really appreciate that person is to actually spend time with them. I mean, literally, this sounds real old-fashioned to a lot of young people today, but you had to spend time with each other. You know, you didn't have the access of, you know, being able to message or do, do an iMessage or, you know, um, FaceTime. All of that is possible today. And, and young people, they can spend time with each other without actually being with each other. But we had to spend time with each other. Those of you from that era and before, you understand completely what I mean. Now, somebody that you found and you thought they were really neat and you really liked them and you started developing deep feelings with them, how, how was it that you showed that you cared about them you you wanted to spend time with them you wanted to talk to them as much as possible I mean if if I wasn't in class uh, I was trying to find figure out a way to be with candy or to talk to candy there was no way in the world I wanted her to think that I was going to take her lightly or that I was going to neglect her because I really liked her. I liked her so much, I thought, I think I might want to marry this girl. And so I spent time with her. I took it seriously. I wanted her to know that I thought she was important. And that's the way Christ needs to be to us. That's the way the salvation that we have in Christ needs to be. We need to make sure that he believes that we take him seriously. And we're not going to neglect him. And, and we're not going to allow anything in our lives to start drifting 
uh, allowing us to drift away from the rock of our salvation, what we found in him. So he says, number one, beware of drifting. Second thing he says, look over to chapter 3. He says, beware of departing. Chapter 3, uh, let's read two or three verses here beginning in verse 12. He says, beware, here's another warning, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So there's the concepts of de departing from God. Instead, he says, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold, um, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion just in verse 12 there is a lot of information about departing from God five definite facts emerge from this verse and a lot of it is about how it's possible to depart from God he says number one uh, it's possible for a Christian to fall away from the living God number two it's a disaster due to an unbelieving heart number three an unbelieving heart is actually evil number four a god is not a mere influence but he's a living person he's a living god and number five there are adequate grounds upon which a christian may avoid falling away if we want to avoid falling away we need to avoid unbelief that means we need to cre increase our faith verse 12 if we want to avoid falling away and departing from the living God, he, we should exhort one another daily. We need each other. We need each other's encouragement. And so one of the warnings here in the book of Hebrews about losing what is so precious to us is not only might it start drifting away from us, it also may start departing from us because of a little thing called faith or a lack of it and having an evil heart of unbelief. You know, most people don't just fall off a cliff when it comes to God. They don't just day one start unbelieving and losing their faith. It is a, a gradual thing. Just like the drifting away, the departing can be a very gradual thing. It says that we can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin Again, that would be a gradual thing. It would start to slowly harden us, the deceitfulness of sin. And then there's a third warning uh, here in Hebrews. He uh, also says in chapter 4 to beware of disobedience. If you go over to chapter 4, look at verse 11, 12, and 13. He's warning now about missing out on the rest, which is code i guess you would say for heaven for the reward he, he's warning about missing out on the rest and and he says in verse 11 let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience if you go back and read the beginning of this chapter he's talking about those in the wilderness who disobeyed god and they did not enter the rest they did not enter enter canaan which is symbolic of us being able to go to heaven for, he says, verse 12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the hearts and the, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. For there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He says, beware that you would become disobedient. Now, the first couple of things we've talked about, drifting away or, or departing or falling away, those are the kind of things that don't happen suddenly. They happen over time. That those, those are the kind of things that can slip up on you, if you will. But he cuts straight to the chase here in describing what the children of Israel did in the wilderness. He says they were children of disobedience. And, and it's no accident that he, when, ta when he talks about disobedience, he turns immediately to describing what? The Word of God. There is a correlation between knowing the Word of God and doing the Word of God and being a person of faith and a person of obedience and a person, if you don't do it, of disobedience. And that is the strict warning that is given here in these verses. 
Beware of becoming disobedient like the children of Israel. The fourth warning, if you go over to chapter 5, is a warning, once again, of something that can happen very slow. Most of these things are things that can happen slowly, and you may not even be paying attention. Look at chapter 5 and verse 11, and here the, the, the warning is to beware of dullness. Chapter 5 and verse 11. Now, earlier he's talking about the uh, priesthood of Melchizedek fascinating story that you read about in the book of genesis and he's talking about how jesus is not after the order of the levitical priesthood he is after the order of the priesthood of melchizedek and then he says verse 11 of whom talking about the priesthood of melchizedek of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing this is fascinating to me. It's the inspired writer is saying, if, if you had not become dull of hearing, I could tell you a lot more about the priesthood of Melchizedek. I, I wish that the people then had been on their game and we would have learned more about the priesthood of Melchizedek. But because we, we can't learn, but because he, he can't say that to them, he can't go on and explain to them how Jesus is better than the, than the high priest under, the, under Levi, and how he is after the order of Melchizedek, he says, I, I can't tell you these wonderful things because why? You have become dull of hearing. And he describes the scenario like this. He says, for though by this time, verse 12, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe but solid food belongs to those who are of full age that is those who by reason use their senses exercise to discern both good and evil if you go on in chapter six he talks about uh, leaving behind the a discussion of the elementary principles of christ what what he's saying to these people is you have slowly but surely become dull of hearing you're not learning anymore you're not listening to what god would have you to know and what he would want you to do there is the warning against being dull of hearing or dullness there's one more warning we could point out more but i want to i want you to go over to one other verse in chapter 12 go all the way over to chapter 12 and look at verse 25 and this would be the warning of declining. The warning of declining. He says in verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. The word refuse here is a word that simply means to avoid or to decline hebrews warns that we can get to the point where we decline the voice of god it is a sad state in our world when people would rather hear the voice of a man over the voice of god and here is a warning do not let this happen I hope you've noticed in every one of these warnings that we've talked about, at the heart of each one is a knowledge of the will of God, a knowledge of the Word of God, knowing the Word of God. The, the only way that we can avoid these things and we can beware of these things is to have a knowledge of God. We'll drift if we neglect salvation and by the way, back there in Hebrews chapter 2, I hope you noticed that the, the word that he was talking about had been confirmed by all of the miracles that were done in those days. There is the connection between the drifting and the word of God. Uh, beware of departing in chapter 3. Again, the knowledge of the word of God is key there. The, the danger of disobedience, as we talked about in chapter 4, Obviously, the only way you know how to obey God is to know His will. If you love me, keep my commandments, He says. And the idea of becoming dull uh, of hearing obviously means we've got to open up our ears and we've got to really listen and we've got to obey 
And then this being dull, uh, rather be wary of declining, avoiding, willfully choosing to avoid or to neglect listening to God. What a great warning. And what dire consequences if that happens. What is at stake in these warnings is losing the most precious thing that you can ever find. I hope, and by all means, most of you have found that precious gift of Jesus. And I'm glad you're here tonight to reinforce your faith and to avoid what we've talked about tonight. To beware of letting that go and turning our back on that. If though that you have not found him and you want to find him and you want to come to him, the invitation of Jesus is available through your faith, your repentance, and your willingness to confess Jesus before men. You, you can begin your journey with God tonight as you're baptized into him. But if you found him, you found the most precious thing, it's like a treasure buried in a field and a person that finds that, they're going to go away and they're going to sell all they have so they can buy that. That's one of the parables that Jesus tells. And you found the most precious thing. Never let it go. Never turn your back on it. The thing you might have left to find that, to come to Jesus, it's not as good and it's not as important as what Jesus is. He's far better. He is the best. And yet if you struggled with letting something creep back into your life drift back into your life and, and you're allowing your faith and your salvation in him to not be as important through your neg negligence as it needs to be we would like to pray with you tonight so we invite you to come as well you can do that right now as we stand and as we sing